SEP Fanfic Readings presents My True Love Gave to Me by Notebook and Ink Chapter 6 I Want a Hippogriff for Christmas Part 2 December 2002 You are cordially invited to the Malfoy Family Annual Christmas Party Saturday, December 21st, 2002 at 5 o'clock in the evening Dinner and drinks followed by a special surprise event Black and white cocktail attire encouraged. Draco stood in his tailored obsidian tux near a set of ornate double doors. His mother was approaching him with a bright red rose, which she then proceeded to pin onto his lapel, before patting his chest twice. She was perfectly put together, not a hair out of place, and her flowing all-white dress robes made her red lipstick even more noticeable. The clock hadn't yet struck 4.30 before their party guests started arriving, all no doubt intrigued by the invitation's mention of the special surprise event, hoping they could get a sneak peek of what was to come. Though they were sorely disappointed, as nothing about the manor seemed out of the ordinary, other than the Christmas decorations. Together they greeted their guests one by one, his mother with a smile, and Draco with a firm handshake. They were all being ushered into the ballroom, for it had been set up as their dining room for the evening, and they were to sit down and enjoy a full five-course French meal, there had to be at least thirty-five tables set up on the checkered floor, each with crisp white tablecloths, white china, black chairs, and black vases filled with bright red roses from his mother's garden. Dispersed along the walls were the familiarly large evergreen trees, charmed to be completely white, and decorated with black and red ornaments as well as ribbons. Once again the ceiling had been made to snow, something he had missed last year. It was always his favorite detail. Having shaken nearly two hundred hands, and the clock ticking closer and closer to five, Draco was beginning to think he had sent off his invitation too late, and his guest of honor wouldn't show. He was motioning for a fat old wizard to head into the ballroom, when he heard familiar voices coming from the foyer. As he turned back around, Harry and Ginerva were coming towards him, and just behind them was Granger. A small smile tugged on his lips. She wore a tight black cocktail dress with an illusion sweetheart neckline, and strappy black heels. Half of her hair was pinned back into some type of braided crown, while the other half remained loose around her shoulders, and her arm was entwined with another's. His smile faded as quickly as it had appeared. The man was tall, fairly muscular, swarthy, and his robe seemed just a little too tight. Draco prided himself on being good with faces, but he'd never seen this wizard before in his life. When the group of friends were finally standing before him, Draco was silent, and all eyes seemed to be on him for what felt like an eternity. "'Good evening, Porters,' his mother piped up with a thousand-watt smile, saving them all from the awkward silence. "'And Miss Granger, how lovely of you to join us. Please do make your way in. We will be starting soon.' She motioned for them to head in. Stoically, Draco shook Potter's hand, and the new wizards as well, though if he firmed it up on purpose for the second, he'd never tell. Draco's mother gave her customary speech with him by her side, and try as he might not to, his eyes immediately scanned the tables to see where Granger and her wizard were sitting amongst the crowd. They were not too far off from his own table, and when he took his seat he had direct line of sight to them. There was no way it was a coincidence, and if he was a betting man, he'd put money down that Theo somehow convinced Pansy to let him alter the seating arrangements at the last minute. Through every course, he watched the foursome chat, and Granger would laugh at whatever her mystery wizard had to say while she lightly touched his arm from time to time. She'd not once lightly touched his arm when he'd made her laugh. Draco was finding his scowl growing harder and harder to hide, and by the time dinner was almost over, he needed something stiffer to drink than champagne. As the main course dishes started disappearing, and the dessert ones arrived, Draco got up from his chair and swept over to the bar near the large fireplace at the other end of the expansive room. Two double glasses of fire whiskey, he ordered the bartender. The witch paused her task of cleaning a glass with a towel and snapped her fingers. Two whiskey tumblers floated down in front of him before an expensive-looking bottle poured out the amber liquid. He grabbed one and turned around to face the party, his eyes seeming to seek out Granger and her mystery wizard of their own volition. They were still with the potters, but had been joined by his aunt Andromeda and young cousin Teddy. Drago tossed back the entirety of the burning liquid, and set the glass down in exchange for the other. "'I thought you said you didn't have feelings for her,' Theo smirked as he slid in beside Draco. 
I don't, he asserted. Then you might want to consider wiping that look off your face. What look? Draco peered suspiciously over at his friend, then took a smaller drink of his second glass. The one like you had when we were kids and you had gotten your first toy broom for Christmas. I came over the next day and used it before you had a chance. I think it's called hateful jealousy. Draco grimaced, then turned his attention back to the small group amidst the party. You know, if you stare any harder at him, you'll bore holes through the poor guy's head, and that would be such a waste of a handsome face. Thea raised a hand to get the bartender's attention. Feeling embarrassed about apparently being so blatantly obvious, Draco turned his attention back to his drink. I wasn't expecting her to bring a date, he said into the glass. He's not a date, per se, Theo corrected him, then placed a drink order of his own. He's a co-worker she brought with her from South America. He wanted to experience the holidays in the UK, so she invited him to spend them with her family. How do you know that? Draco asked. Never mind. I don't know why I still bother asking after all these years. Theo chuckled. You know I can't help introducing myself to a pretty face. Just before dinner, I went over and talked to them. Like you should. Right now. Theo grabbed his arm and shoved him away from the bar. Before we burst into flame from your staring, he muttered after him. I heard that, Draco called over his shoulder before swallowing down the second glass of fire whiskey. You were meant to, you stupid arse. Noticing none of them had drinks, and having to play the part of good host, Draco was about to grab one of the waiters with a full tray of champagne flutes to offer the group, but a shock of shaggy red hair near the doorway grabbed his attention instead. Ronald Weasley, in plain clothes no less. Draco's eyebrows turned down with displeasure. Weasley must have spotted his friends, as Draco's gaze followed him while he weaved in and out of the crowd until he reached them, then started speaking animatedly. "'What is he doing here?' Pansy spit from beside him. "'I don't know,' he answered calmly. "'You'd think if he was crashing he would have worn something less conspicuous.' "'I don't think it would have mattered. "'Don't you remember what his dress robes looked like at Yule Ball?' Draco quipped. "'Well, I'm gonna—' Pansy started to move forward, but Draco put an arm out to stop her. "'Do nothing,' he finished for her. "'I'll handle it.' Draco dropped his arm away from Pansy, and waved the other to send the waiter off into the crowd. He fidgeted with his cufflinks for a moment, pushed a hand through his hair, then strode off towards the group of his old classmates. First Harry and Ginny, now you too? Miney, what's gotten into you?' Weasley seethed. Draco noticed Granger flinch at the nickname. "'How can you even be in this house right now?' the ginger continued. Many guests were starting to take notice of the loud arrival— Granger's mystery wizard seemed unsure of what to do or where to look. "'Ron, please, you're making a scene,' Granger begged and placed a hand on his forearm. "'I don't care!' he ripped his arm out of her grasp, and Draco quickened his steps. "'Malfoy and I are friends, Ron. Harry and I have both made peace with the past. Why can't you?' she pleaded. "'He's the same git he's always been. Maybe towards you, Ron, but that's only because you provoked it.' How's he supposed to be nice and cheery around you when all you do is spit insults and never give him a chance? I will never forgive the snake for the things he's done, Weasley spit out the words, then got right in Granger's face. Or do you need a reminder before you slither into his... I'm going to have to ask you to leave, Weasley, Draco interrupted sternly. This party is strictly invitation only. Weasley pulled away from Granger and fixed his hateful gaze on Draco instead. Draco took a step forward and placed himself between Granger and the volatile redhead. "'Maybe I was invited,' he replied with a smirk. When they were young, Weasley had always been taller. But when Draco hit his growth spurt later on, they'd evened out. Now they were practically eye to eye. "'Doubtful,' he said calmly. "'Pansy handles the invites, and she likes you less than I do.' Draco could see the color of Weasley's face begin to match his hair, and he knew he should try to de-escalate the situation— but he wasn't sure he could pass up the opportunity of putting Weasley in his place. Another hard habit to break, and some fights were worth it. Ron closed the small distance between them so they were nose to nose. Draco straightened up even further, his face a mask of the calm intimidation he'd perfected over the years, a stark contrast to Weasley's wild anger. "'If you think I'm going to stand by while you barge into my home and accost my guests, you have grown even more idiotic than when we were at school.' Draco stated. 
All right, Ginevra intervened. Ron, you're leaving. Harry, grab him and go. No, Ron didn't even spare a glance to his sister. This is a long time coming, and it's gonna happen. No, it isn't, Granger called from behind Draco. Petrificus Totalis. Weasley went rigid, and Potter caught him before he hit the floor. As much as he wasn't fond of having Granger's wand so close to his back, Draco wished he could have taken a picture of the shocked look frozen on Weasley's face. Everyone else turned to her, and she simply shrugged. He's already mad at me, she explained. Better I did it than any of you. We'll take him home, Ginevra sighed. She clearly didn't want to leave before the big event. Sorry about the intrusion, Malfoy, Harry said as he looked around at all the witches and wizards looking in on their little melodrama. It's all right, Potter, Draco relaxed. Should you and your wife wish to return for the remainder of the evening, you are more than welcome. Thanks. We'll see how long it takes him to get settled down, Harry replied. Draco was about to turn around to Granger, when his mother's voice boomed out among the crowd, beckoning everyone to make their way to the gardens for the second half of the night. The bodies pressed in and around them as everyone made their way through the double doors that led to the patio. Granger's mystery wizard finally came to her side, and together they walked off, but not before she threw a backward glance at him. Draco held back, but kept her gaze until she faced forward again, and he melted back into the crowd. The patio was filled with gasps of shock and awe as the guests beheld the spectacle. A tall, wrought-iron fence now surrounded the garden, and atop the closed gates spelled out in the iron was Le Cirque de Rive. Hung on the gates was a black sign painted with white letters. Open at nightfall, closes at dawn. Beyond the fence loomed an enormous canvas tent with black and white stripes. Around it were smaller tents of the same fabric, and between their spires little globes of lights were strung to illuminate the darkness of the evening. As the crowd approached the gates, they swung open of their own accord to allow entry. When Draco stepped through, the very air tingled with magic, and he felt a pleasingly warm sensation with his skin. The entire encircled area must have been doused with warming charms to fight off the December chill. A good thing, too, since they were all in their dress clothes. On the ground, among the tents, were a handful of pushcarts with black and white canopies, beholding all manner of sweet treats awaiting to be indulged in. In the middle of the arena was a cast-iron cauldron the size of a soaking tub, with a huge bonfire burning brightly inside and sending embers up into the night sky. Draco looked around as the crowd finally thinned from dispersing into the circus, but he didn't see Granger anywhere so he decided to get a small bag of popcorn from one of the carts and wander. He meandered tent to tent and smiled as he noticed the pleased faces of his fellow witches and wizards. He was sure an event like this would seem a grand spectacle to muggles, and even though this crowd was used to the magic, he was glad to see they were still enjoying themselves nonetheless. He figured they appreciated the creativity and ingenuity it took to put together something of this magnitude. Draco surely counted himself among the impressed. When he entered the tent with an entire garden made of completely of ice, he found Pansy. She was wandering amongst the glistening flowers, and he noticed she'd added a red scarf to her all-black outfit. "'This really is wonderful, Pansy,' Draco smiled as he lightly bumped her into her shoulder. "'You really pulled out all the stops.' "'Thanks,' she bumped him back and beamed with pride. "'How did you find out about this circus?' he asked and extended her his bag of popcorn." She held up a hand in polite refusal, then took in the beauty of the room some more. "'My grandfather was a fan of it for many years. He took me along a few times when I was little.' She shook her head. "'I can't tell you how hard it was just to track them down, and then to get the owner to agree to bring it here. Part of its whole bit is that you never know where it'll turn up.' "'Well, I'm sure my mother has told you already how much she appreciates your help with these parties, but I'd like to as well.' Draco took her hand and gave it a light kiss. "'Thank you, Pansy.' "'You're welcome,' she looked over and gave him a small smile, which he returned. The pair turned when they heard boisterous laughter entering the tent. Theo and Granger, South American wizard, were joining them inside. "'Now's your chance,' Pansy leaned in. "'You better go get your girl before someone else does.' Draco simply nodded his head at her in farewell, then made his way back to the exit." Again, he looked around the circus for a familiar shade of brown hair, but came up empty. There were so many tents, it would probably take hours for him to search every one. He had to think like Granger. Though, spending any time inside her jumble of a mind was a bit of a scary thought. 
If he were her, after what happened inside the ballroom with Weasley, he'd want a bit of solitude. So Draco made his way towards the back of the circus and into what appeared to be the smallest tent. When he stepped through the flap, the inside was absolutely enormous and held the biggest, most twisted tree he'd ever seen. Its branches, instead of leaves, held what looked to be candles in the shape of a lotus flowers. Some were closed up in buds, others in full bloom, and others melting away, dripping their wax onto the ground. On the outer edge of the tent were benches, and staring up into the tree from one was Granger. As Draco walked over, he felt tension he hadn't realized he'd been carrying begin to fade, but it was replaced with a slight queasiness in his stomach. Perhaps tossing back the whiskies wasn't such a good idea after all, though there was something to be said for liquid courage. "'I thought I might find you here,' he smiled as he arrived at her side. Granger looked up at him with a wide smile of her own, then patted the empty spot on the bench beside her. He obliged the silent invitation and sat down. "'You didn't need to intervene with Ron, you know,' she said quietly. "'What kind of a host would I be if I hadn't?' he replied with a smirk. Clearly she was still upset about the matter. "'But you really didn't need my help. You handled him all on your own. I was just a good distraction.' "'He shouldn't have even come here. He'd obviously been drinking, and I'm sure he'll regret it in the morning.' "'Do you think you will?' he asked. "'Regret coming here in the morning?' "'No, why would I?' "'Well, Weasley had a point. "'This place doesn't exactly hold great memories for you. "'When I got the invitation, which I was surprised by, "'that was the first thing that crossed my mind. "'But Ginny told me how much fun she'd had last year, "'and that you'd done renovations. "'She was right. "'It doesn't look at all like I remember. "'And so far I've been fine.' "'Only one part of her reply confused him. "'Why were you surprised you got an invitation?' "'Didn't you say after dinner that Pansy handles the invitations? "'She and I don't exactly have a great past.' "'I sent your invitation.' Granger quickly turned her head around to face him with a look of surprise on her soft features. "'It should have been sent sooner, but I didn't know if you'd want to come. "'What with the limited time you've had back home.' "'A little more notice would have been nice,' she breathed a laugh. "'Then I wouldn't have had to borrow a dress from Chinny, "'and Matthias wouldn't have had to bribe Neville out of his dress robes.' since he was the closest fit. Draco looked down at his fingers and fiddled with his ring. Speaking of, how's your date enjoying Christmas in England? You seem to like him a lot. I'm surprised you've never mentioned him in your letters, or at lunch. He says he likes the look of the snow, she started, but he isn't overly fond of the cold. He'll have warming charms perfected by the time we go back, I'm sure. I do like him, but I didn't bring him as my date in the sense that he's my boyfriend or anything— we just work together. Oh, Draco rubbed the back of his neck. Speaking of Christmas, Granger excitedly reached into her bag and pulled out a small present, wrapped neatly in green paper with a silky black bow, then held it out to him. I got this for you. Draco hesitated and looked back and forth between her eyes and the gift. I didn't get anything for you, he admitted. That's okay. Take it. She extended it further, so he obliged. "'What is it?' he inspected. Granger rolled her eyes. "'Open it so you can find out, silly.' Draco did as he was bid. He pulled on one end of the bow and watched it unravel, then ripped open the shining paper. He opened the box and inside was some sort of small white brick. His brows knit in confusion. "'No, really. What is it?' "'It's called an iPod. It's like your portable CD player, but you don't have to carry around the CDs.' They're inside of it. Look. Granger pushed on it, and the device lit up. On it were the words, I want a hippogriff for Christmas. I took the liberty of putting some muggle holiday songs on already, and I may have changed the name of this one. She smiled at her little jab at him. Draco feigned seriousness. Is this your idea of a joke, Granger? Yes. Very funny, he chuckled. I was very seriously injured by that beast, you know. "'Sure you were,' she rolled her eyes and grabbed the brick out of his hand. "'You can put other songs on it, too.' Then she paused for a moment. "'Although I suppose you don't have a computer. You're probably going to need my help.' Draco took it back from her. "'So you gave me a gift I can only use with you. "'Unless you only want to listen to Muggle Holiday music. I can take it back.' She started to reach for it again. "'No!' 
he said quickly and put his hand over hers. I like it. He let his hand linger there for a moment as they looked into each other's eyes. Granger was the first to back away, and Drago let his fingers graze the back of her hand as he moved it back to his own lap. Do you want to make a wish? she asked after a long beat of silence. What? He raised a brow in confusion. That's what the tree is for. She gestured to the great spectacle before them, and the sign next to it. You light one of the candles, make your wish, then leave it on the tree. When it comes true, it'll melt off to make room for more wishes. It couldn't hurt, I suppose, Draco said, then stood up from the bench, slid the brick into his pocket, then held his hand out to assist her. She took his offered hand, but surprised him when she didn't let go until they'd walked over to the base of the tree near a group of low-hanging branches. Together they picked a bud, and lit it off another flower already glowing nearby. Granger slowly closed her eyes to make a wish, but Draco couldn't drive himself to do the same. He wanted to be with her like this forever if he could, alone with this easy proximity. They were now mere inches from each other, and lit up with the soft glow of a thousand candles. When she opened her eyes again, they both looked down at their hands, and their flowers had bloomed with their wishes. Draco was slightly confused, as he never thought of the words, I wish. What did you wish for? He asked her, as he reached up to place his glowing flower on a higher branch. I can't tell you, or it won't come true, she replied as she did the same. Is that written somewhere? He smirked, the pair of them finishing placing their flowers, and settled back into themselves, their reaching having brought their bodies within brushing distance. Draco looked down into her chocolatey brown eyes, while his hand came up to caress her face. Again, she surprised him by not pulling away, and leaning into the touch of his palm instead. Before he could talk himself out of it, he bent down and pressed a slow and tender kiss to her warm lips. When Granger reciprocated and placed her hand on his chest, he deepened it. His one hand slid back along her jaw and gently held her head while his other sought out her hip. Her dress was a velvety soft fabric that hugged her curves and left little to the imagination. He'd have to remember to think Geneva some day. Draco nudged her lips with his tongue, asking permission to enter her sweet mouth, and she granted it. As their tongues danced, she slid her arms further up and around his neck, then brushed her fingers into the short hair at the back of his head. She let out a small moan, and Draco needed no more convincing that she wanted this as much as he did. He took two steps forward and pressed her into the base of the tree. He pulled his lips away, which she protested with a slight whimper, and began focusing their attention on her neck. He'd just begun making his way up to her ear when his own picked up voices outside the tent flaps. He could only imagine the flack she would take in the press if the golden girl was caught in the compromising position with him of all people. While his family was making progress getting back into the good graces of society, there were still plenty of people around who wished them ill will. Draco pulled back and sighed heavily into her hair, then placed his forehead on her shoulder. Granger stroked the back of his neck a few times in very calming motions, as if she was wordlessly telling him that she understood. Finally, Draco retreated from her mane and straightened to his full height. He reached out with his hand, and once again she took it, then pulled herself away from the tree. Just as they were coming out from behind the branches, a large group of party guests came through the tent flap, as Draco slowly dropped her hand. Draco spent the next week trying very hard to think about anything other than his kiss with Granger, or obsess over what gift he should buy for her since she got him something. This was all made even more difficult when the apothecary was closed over the holiday. During those three days, he tried to occupy his mind by locking himself in his study and researching. He spent two days compiling a list of the more rare potion ingredients, then meticulously went through each one's benefits, side effects, and any possible negative interaction should they be mixed with the ingredients they needed to use. He'd finished with that on Christmas Eve. Luckily, since the war, Theo came over every year to spend Christmas with Draco and his mother, which was a welcome distraction, but only took up a day or two. Finally, it was Friday, and he was back in the office, but he couldn't quite concentrate on potion-making when he was thinking about whether or not Granger was going to walk through his office door. She said she'd visit if she had time, but after what happened at the party, it was entirely possible she changed her mind and no longer wanted anything to do with him. Around noon, Draco was again at his desk, 
He had one elbow propped up on its surface, the attached hand scratching through his hair while the other lazily flipped through pages of a book he had gone through at least three times already. He had tried to keep himself in a relatively less disheveled state today, and made extra sure he didn't roll up his sleeves at all, lest he forget to roll them back down again. From the light knock that rapped on the office door, Draco could tell it was Trudy. She was probably just coming up to check on him and make sure he would eat lunch, as she had taken to doing. "'Excuse me, sir,' she opened the door and poked her dark-haired head in. "'But you have a visitor. Would you like me to show them in?' Draco's heart beat a little faster, and he sat up straight at his desk. "'Yes, that's fine.' Trudy pushed the door open all the way, then stepped out of the way. From behind her came Granger, and Draco couldn't help the small smile that appeared on his face. "'Hello, Miss Granger,' he greeted and motioned to the chair opposite his desk. "'Please, have a seat.' Granger took off her coat and hung it on the rack next to his. She was wearing a white collared shirt under a maroon jumper with a gold H on the front that he recalled her having at school, though now with a woman's body it was a little tighter fitting, and again she was wearing her muggle jeans, which hugged her shapely legs and bum. Draco felt desire thicken his blood. He cleared his throat. That will be all, Trudy. Thank you. As Granger crossed the room, Trudy shot him a quick thumbs up before she closed the door and went back downstairs. When the brilliant witch took her seat, Draco suddenly realized that while he'd been thinking about her for the better part of a week, he hadn't thought of a single good way to start a conversation with her. Now that she was in front of him, he was drawing a complete blank. Should he bring up the night of the party? Or was it perhaps better to just let it be? "'What are you working on?' she drew him from his thoughts. "'Oh, nothing helpful. I'm a bit stuck on this potion, to be honest,' he replied. "'Do you want some help?' In a bit. Apparently they weren't going to discuss the kiss. Would you like a tour first? That would be great, she smiled. Draco did a quick physical check before he rose from his chair and came around to the front of his desk. Granger got up as well, placed her bag where she'd been sitting, and looked around his office. She brushed past him, which sent a shiver up his spine, then went over to the three large windows behind his desk that overlooked the alley. The Weasley's joke shop was just on the corner, and Draco had grown so tired of watching that rabbit disappear under the hat, so he'd taken to ignoring the windows. This is where I am most of the day, unless I have investment meetings or evening obligations. Evening obligations? You mean dates? she asked, with a smirk over her shoulder at him. Sometimes, he shrugged with a smile of his own. I'm a very rich and desirable bachelor wizard, you know. I'm just waiting for the call from which weekly to schedule an article. Granger giggled, but in a way he was being serious. He fulfilled every other duty his mother had laid upon him, and now she was getting impatient that he was dragging his heels on choosing someone to marry. But if he was being honest with himself, the real reason was here in his office, now moving to look at his bookshelves. "'Quite the collection. I could stay in here all day,' she mused as she looked through the leather-bound tomes. He knew he would let her if she asked. "'Thanks.' I had a lot brought over from the family library, and I have a few friends on the lookout for me when they travel as well. I could do that for you, too, if you like, she turned to him. I mean, we're friends, aren't we? Of course, he replied with a nod. He wanted to be so much more than that, but if she didn't feel the same, he wouldn't push it. Right now, I mostly need anything potion-related, but if you find something on another subject you think is interesting, you can surely send it my way if you want. "'I'll do that,' she smiled. "'Should we go downstairs? "'I can show you the stock room and the brewing room. "'Then we can come back up here "'and you can look over my notes "'on what we've accomplished with the potion so far.' "'Okay.' "'Drago led her down the stairs, "'and as they descended, "'he went through all the renovations and changes "'they'd made to the shop after they'd purchased it. "'They did a quick walk through the sales floor, "'said hello to Trudy, "'then walked down the hallway towards the stock room "'where he showed her the inventory.' all the common potions they kept on hand, as well as some of their own devising. In their last stop, the brewing room, Granger had the most questions, like he assumed she would. Draco answered most of them as best he could, and the rest he left to Bartholomew. The middle-aged potions master he'd hired thoroughly enjoyed having his brain picked. About an hour later, they said farewell to Bart, and made their way back to the front of the shop. "'Would you like some lunch?' he asked. "'I can have Trudy call out for something.' "'Yes, that would be great,' she replied with a smile. "'All right. You can head up. I'll be along in a minute.' 
when Draco came through the door of his office, Granger was once again looking through his bookshelves. She stretched up, attempting to grab something off a shelf that was just out of reach, so the hem of her jumper had lifted, exposing her bare midriff. Draco gulped as he once again felt his blood heat up. He wasn't sure how much longer he could keep up the gentlemanly act. He'd gone far too long without touching her already. He closed the door with a soft click, then made his way over and stood just behind her. "'Finding anything you might like to take back with you?' he asked. "'A fair few things.' She turned around and was a little taken aback by how close he was, but seemed to ease quickly. "'You can take what you like. For a small fee, of course,' he smirked. "'Oh, really? And how much is the fee going to set me back?' She raised a brow and crossed her arms. Draco leaned down, turned his face, and pointed to his cheek. "'Draco!' she shoved his shoulder and giggled. Draco's blood burned. He'd never heard her say his given name before— but he loved how it sounded coming from her lips, and what it did to him. The jovial smile on his face turned lascivious, and his eyes darkened. "'Do that again,' he demanded, his voice husky. "'Shove you?' her brow quirked. "'Say my name.' Granger's brow dropped, and her own eyes darkened as well. "'Draco,' she whispered. In a flurry of passion, he seized her face and crushed his lips to hers. She reciprocated in kind, so Draco pressed her into the bookshelf just as he had the tree the night of the party. Then he waved his hand towards the office door to lock it as well as throw up a silencing charm. They would not be interrupted again. Just as he had done the other night, Draco buried himself in her neck. Draco, she breathed. Hmm, he mumbled against her skin. As much as I really want this to happen, she started, and he could feel a butt coming, so he stopped. I'm not entirely sure we should. Draco pulled back and gazed into her woeful eyes. Why? I'm leaving again in a few days, and I don't ever know when I'm going to get back. That's not exactly fair to either of us. Maybe it would be better if we don't do anything. Draco raised his hands and placed them gently on either side of her face. "'You are an amazing witch, Hermione Granger, and I count myself extremely lucky to get to spend any amount of time with you. I'm not ashamed to tell you how badly I want you, and have for a while, but if you truly think we shouldn't complicate our tenuous relationship, I will respect your choice.' Granger lifted up onto her toes and placed a quick kiss on his lips. "'We're both adults, right?' Right, Draco raised a brow in suspicion. Then we should be able to just have a casual sexual relationship, right? Draco smirked as he caught up to her train of thought. Yes, most definitely, he nodded. Granger smiled and kissed him deeper. Then he pressed his forehead to hers. You little minx. Let me give you your Christmas present. Again, his voice was dark and sultry. <laughs>